I'm Alex Michelson. This week on The Issue is the recall candidates hitting the campaign trail, including Caitlyn Jenner. I used to train here <laughs> years ago. We're with her in Venice near Gold's Gym. We go one on one with the reality show star talking homelessness, COVID and her recent trip to Australia. Then Governor Newsom and Larry Elder both seem to be talking like this is a two man race, both hitting the campaign trail hard. We break down what's going on behind the scenes. Democratic strategist Bob Shrum, Republican strategist Mike Murphy standing by. And later, I talk with the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and Congresswoman Maxine Waters about the future of the child tax credit, infrastructure, and how they're getting involved in the recall race. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. Some Californians already have received and turned in their ballots in the recall race. The pace of campaigning is intensifying. Governor Newsom attending his first official campaign events this week, including this one in San Francisco, where he's meeting with volunteers. Larry Elder in San Jose at a packed church for his biggest campaign event yet. He also held his first press conference as a candidate. Former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner in Covina focus on the homeless and on law enforcement. Caitlyn Jenner posting this video from the border where she is meeting with law enforcement and standing there. She also stopped in Venice to talk about homelessness. We spoke to her last in our studio in June, which was her first statewide interview. Now she's giving us her first interview of the new statewide tour following her stint taping Big Brother VIP in Australia. Caitlin Good seeing Jenner, you welcome, again. Welcome back to The Issue Is. I, I got to give you credit because last time you said that you would come back and answer more questions and you're back. And here we are. Yeah. We're back. Yes, so, we're ready to go. So uh, the, the big issue of this day is homelessness. We're here on the streets of Venice. Last time you said you wanted to give us more specifics on that. What specifically are you doing as governor to solve homelessness? Right now, the homeless crisis in, in California has become such an industry. And studying this, you see how Gavin Newsom, what does he do? He throws money at the issue and then to special interests, and then that's the end of it. If you look at some of the top nonprofits, 90% of the money that they take in is towards the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Only about 10% of the money sent to them is actually goes to the homeless. Right. I want the California taxpayer to get a good return on their investment, and they are not getting a good return on their investment, not even close when it comes to this. Plus, special interests, if they solve the homeless issue, they don't have a job anymore. Right. So there's no incentive to do that. The next round of budgeting would be determined by the results that they get. Is their programs actually working yeah. to solve the homeless problem? That would be by far the first thing I would do. Okay. If, if we send them millions of dollars and nothing gets done, uh, yeah, they're not gonna get the money next time. We're gonna go with the organizations that actually gets results. Uh, so this is your first campaign appearance um, since your trip away. I was just How waiting was to come back to see you. How was it? <laughs> How was your time away? Oh, the time away was fine. I yeah. mean, I had an obligation before this campaign even started and I've been actually on this campaign since last April and talk to you a long time right. ago. I've been doing this for a while, uh, but I had a contract that I had signed beforehand. And, you know, all of the candidates that are running up against Gavin Newsom, they all have jobs. Right. And I, I have a job. But, but, you know, there's some people that say oh, that going and doing go. a reality show, maybe you're not taking this as seriously as some of the other candidates. What I do would, you say to that criticism? Uh, I, when I was down in Australia, I was in constant contact with my campaign. I did. Uh, radio ads, I did some Zoom ads, I did all this stuff um, at, while I was down there. There was only a week period that actually I was in the house and then I got out and came back here five weeks before this recall. Uh, I am, this is the kickoff, you're my first one. I appreciate it. <laughs> and, and, and this is the kickoff of the next four and a half weeks. And the other big issue right now is coronavirus. We see the Delta variant is right. spreading. What's your plan on how to deal with the Delta variant if you're governor? Right now, we have to follow the science. There is between 
the science, okay, the economy. Right. We have to take the economy into effect about the effects that it has on the economy if you completely close it down again. Right. And public health. Right. You have to balance that. Um, right now, I see so much of Gavin Newsom using COVID to shut the place down. What is he We didn't down? need to do that. Shut the whole state down as uh, over the last year. Shut schools down, businesses, all of that shut it down. Different governors have done it different ways. Right. Well, there's, you know, I know you've pointed to the example of Ron DeSantis in Florida, yeah. but right now the cases in Florida are exploding. We are seeing they have a higher death rate per 100,000 than people here. Uh, you know, they're seeing problems with kids in schools because they don't aren't wearing masks in Florida. Is Florida the example? And, and what do you say to people that are like, I don't want to be Florida. Go Governor Newsom says Florida's a COVID cliff. Um, that's depending on that's politics, and it's depending yeah. on how you look at it. But it's Florida. We the can do a better job. We can do a better job. Yeah. DeSantis in Florida has done a very good job in keeping the economy open and keeping the cases low. Obviously, throughout this pandemic, things change, right. and you have to be flexible when things change and do what's right. Do what's right to protect the public, and and that's probably it's by far the most important thing you can do. I worry right now that with Newsom, uh, I don't even know if the schools are going to open. You know, he said last June 15th, he said that the state's going to open. Right. But he did not give up the state of emergency in the state of California, giving right. him a lot of power. So he can still close the schools down. So should kids in schools be wearing masks? Um, that's really up to the science of it. Uh, I'm, the CDC I'm says they a, should. Yes. And if the CDC, I think we should go with that, what the CDC says. But to be honest with you, I, I'm, I don't know if that is the answer, masks. Obviously, vaccinations are very important. I've been vaccinated. I've yeah. gotten through this. Um, and so, um, yeah, we have to just continue to work through it. And honestly, you take it day by day. You are such a great competitor, right? Yes, I am. You've got a competitive spirit. And I know you say that all of the other people on the recall ballot are all on the same team and you're up against Governor Newsom. But in a way, you are also competing against them because you're asking for people to vote for you. Mm -hmm. Right now, Larry Elder seems to be winning the race. He's ahead in the polls, doing the best in terms of fundraising. Governor Newsom is specifically targeting him, saying that he's the front runner. Why should people vote for you over Larry Elder? When I came into this campaign, uh, I made it a national campaign. I mean, I've gotten donations from every state in the nation. Yeah. Um, when you go to Sacramento, you have to have one political power. Yeah. I have political power. I think they're afraid of me because of that, because it, I do have a national platform. I wonder about Larry Elder. He is a, and he's been around obviously for a while. I know Larry, oh, sure. but he's very hard right. I think for California, what they're looking for is they looking for a person that is more center right, and that is me. I call myself an inclusive Republican. Right. Now, why am I a Republican? Because I have conservative economic values. I mean, less taxes, less regulations, pro-business environment. Yeah. But on the social issues, um, I'm also inclusive to all people. Right. Okay, and I think that's what California. We have a large group of undecideds and they're mostly Democrats. Yeah. And I think I appeal more to them because I am more in the middle when it comes to this, especially on social issues. Okay, anything else you want to add? Any last words? You got it. All right, thank Next you Next time much. we'll talk about the budget. Do you anything on the budget? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's a reference to her last appearance on the issue is when we pressed her for specifics on the state budget. Up next, we break down the recall race with two of the smartest minds in politics. Democrat Bob Schrum, Republican Mike Murphy, standing by. We'll talk to him when we come back. A third of all small businesses in California are now gone forever because he ignored science and slammed this state down. It's outrageous. The fight would be for 15 cents with Larry Elder. He doesn't believe in a minimum wage. It should be zero. Governor Gavin Newsom and conservative radio talk show host Larry Elder both seem to be targeting each other in the recall race kind of treating this like it's a one-on-one -on -one matchup. 
So much to dig into in terms of the politics of all this. So I invited two of the smartest guys I know in politics. Bob Schrum is a longtime Democratic strategist who has worked on several presidential campaigns at the highest levels, along with Mike Murphy. He's co-director of the USC Center for the Political Future. Mike Murphy is a longtime Republican strategist who's worked on presidential campaigns at the highest levels. He's the co-host of one of my favorite political podcasts. It's called Hacks on Tap, which you can find wherever you stream your podcasts. Mike, Bob, welcome back to The Issue Is. Glad to be here. Thank you. All right, Mike, let's start with you. Where do you see the state of the recall race right now? Should the governor be concerned? Well, yes. I mean, a paranoia pays off in politics, even when you're in a safe state. I think as the COVID Delta variant has come back, so has Governor Newsom's mounting political problems. We have a lot of polls that show the state's ready to fire him. The problem is, the, from the, for the Republicans, the election's not tomorrow. There's going to be a period now where the Republican opponents are examined. You know, some of them are well known, but not deeply known. And what the Newsom campaign is going to do, and you saw a little of this in your clip, is they're going to try to make the election all about the opponents. They're going to put a they're going to staple a big Donald Trump suit to them, knowing that if they can make this a partisan election with Republican versus Democratic loyalty in this Democratic state, that could bail out Newsom. Now, he's not that great on the attack. He's kind of an attack puppy, as we saw. But any time we're talking about his opponents and not him is a good day for the Newsom campaign. What do you mean by attack puppy? It's just not his style. He's a sunshine politician. That, that's, you know, this is not where he wants to be, but it's an effective weapon for him because if he can polarize the elections. I, I worked for Schwarzenegger in the recall. And with Arnold, you had an acceptable alternative, and it wasn't partisan. So Arnold could get all the Republicans, a bunch of the independents, and pull off some Democrats. We have seen that Democrats are not that fired up for this race compared to where Republicans are at. We learned this week that President Biden and Vice President Harris, both apparently planning potential in-person campaign appearances here in California for Governor Newsom. What kind of impact would that make? Oh, I think it'd have a big impact. Biden is very popular here. Uh, and I think if he comes out here and he weighs in, that will help do what Mike was talking about, which is partisanize this race and also build it around Trump. That's why national Democrats are coming in. That's why Biden is coming in, because they can energize the Democratic base. It also helps, by the way, that everybody's going to get a ballot mailed to. Them. You don't have to do a lot to vote in this. And I think if Trump becomes central in this recall, that Newsom's going to be in better shape than people assume right now. Bob, right now, the Newsom campaign is singling out Larry Elder, naming him in tweets, on the campaign trail, being treated as the front runner. Larry Elder has not done any debates, doesn't plan to do any, um, <laughs> but it doesn't seem to be hurting him. It, it seems like the Republicans have fallen in love with Larry Elder. Well, yeah, he, he clearly is leading among that group of people, but that's why I think this will expand out to indict the Republicans in general you know, Mike, uh, Kevin Faulkner, the former mayor of San Diego, has sort of struggled to answer the Trump question throughout this. Uh, there were a lot of people that thought that he was going to be the front runner in this race. There were a lot of Republicans who thought that he would be endorsed as the Republican nominee. That hasn't happened. There's part of me that feels like he's a little bit like one of your old clients, Jeb Bush, and Larry Elder's kind of like Donald Trump. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, maybe partially. Hey, I'll endorse him right now. Uh, so there, he just got one vote. But look, California is a mega state. If Arnold Schwarzenegger's name was Arnold Schwartz, nothing would have happened. He was the world's biggest movie star and he had a compelling message. So Falconer's problem is he's running pretty well in San Diego County. But in this enormous state, you need a lot of money with a great message or you need to be famous with a great message. So, you know, there's no machine anymore like in the old days of politics where a bunch of guys with cigars would say, all right, it's going to be Falconer. And there's one candidate. We're, we're now in the Internet age where anybody can run. Ask, ask Jenner. What's going to happen now is something Bob will recognize and I do. Anybody who's been in politics now comes the second look. And the second look is tough if you're not ready for it. And you're going to see ads about Larry Elder, you know, and you're going to see ads about anybody who rises up. If the John Cox's bear shtick ever caught on, you'd see a lot more ads about him. 
But right now, based on name ID, Larry is number one, and so he's going to get the fire. So you're a strategist. You did this before with Schwarzenegger. If you were advising Kevin Faulkner, who you're now endorsing, what would your advice to him be? <laughs> uh, Ray, one, come out against the Murphy <laughs> endorsement. It won't play with the base. Attack that jerk. <laughs> uh, but after I was done doing that, I'd say, look, Kevin, you've been playing a base strategy, and you're not going to out-trump the other guys. That is a mistake. Uh, he, he has to do the suburban center California strategy of, look, I'm center right and I'm not Gavin and I've got sensible plans. I've got a little independence. He's got to have his own brand because he's always going to be the third best Trump guy. And being the Trump guy, even the best Trump guy, kills you long term in California on that second look. Let's talk for a moment about Caitlyn Jenner. Uh, one moment in particular from our interview seems to be getting a lot of attention online. Take a look. Sh should kids in schools be wearing masks? Um, that's really up to the science of it. Uh, I'm, the CDC I'm says not they a, should. Yes. And if the CDC, I think we should go with that, what the CDC says. But to be honest with you, I, I'm, I don't know if that is the answer, masks. Uh, she's not a serious candidate. Uh, the interview actually hurts all the Republicans because it kind of says that the people who are challenging Newsom don't know what they're talking about. I mean, she said, look, uh, we should follow the CDC, but I'm not sure if it works. I mean, she was all over the place. In fact, throughout your interview, she was all over the place. Uh, the most coherent thing she said was, oh, there's Gold's Gym. I used to work out there. Uh, I don't think she made a very persuasive case for herself. And by the way, I want to add on Faulkner, and I think Mike would agree with this. His biggest prop is not just his messaging. He doesn't have the money. He needs about $30 yeah. million dollars to communicate with people across the state. It is expensive. Up next, is it time to mandate vaccines? San Francisco is leading the nation on that, but not everybody is happy. In fact, some people seem to be going crazy over this issue. Bob and Mike return when we come back. And now's their chance to show off those dance moves, which I know they both have. <laughs> Not just to think about, well, my freedom is being kind of disturbed here. No, screw your freedom. Because with freedom comes obligations and, uh, and kind of responsibilities. We cannot just say, I have the right to do X, Y, and Z. When you affect other people, that is when it gets serious. It's like no different than... Former California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger going viral this week for that message about vaccines. In The Atlantic, Arnold pointed out that George Washington mandated vaccines to fight smallpox. They've been a big part of our history ever since. Back now with Bob Schrum and Mike Murphy of the USC Center for the Political Future. Mike, you once worked with Arnold. How do we as a society better communicate this message about vaccines? Because clearly it's not getting through to some folks. Well, I think Arnold did a great job there. He's always had a gift for cutting through the noise you know, coming from pop culture as he does. So I think we need more messaging like that. The freedom thing, and I'm I'm a conservative, almost libertarian on many issues, Republican, but no, I don't have the freedom to fire a machine gun into a crowd. So knocking down the freedom argument is a good thing. But frankly, you know, we got some morons in this country who aren't gonna be persuaded, no matter what the slideshow is or the jingle or the sound bite. So we're gonna have to start cracking down, particularly on vaccinations, and incentivizing people with both carrots and sticks to get vaccinated. And, and on to that point, uh, Bob, this week, San Francisco moved to mandate vaccines for most indoor things. You're gonna have to show proof of vaccination to get into a lot of places. Los Angeles now considering doing something similar. What do you make of, of the politics of that? Uh, I, think it's, I think, A, it's the right public health policy. But B, it's good politics. Uh, I think a very large majority of Californians would support these kind of vaccine mandates. You have to be vaccinated to come to the USC campus, UCLA, any of the state colleges. So why aren't we going to apply this to restaurants, to gyms, to other places? Look, this goes back to a 1906 Supreme Court case where they upheld vaccine mandates. But it also, as Mike suggests, goes back to George Washington. If he hadn't made vaccination against smallpox mandatory, 
I think we'd be sitting here talking to you on the BBC because we would have <laughs> lost the Revolutionary War. Uh, you know, this is tough. And my, our my, dental work would be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd have national health insurance. Yeah. Up next, we talk with Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi about the child tax credit, infrastructure, and more. Welcome back. This week, a rare chance to speak with the most powerful woman in the history of Congress about a bill that impacts almost every single parent. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Congresswoman Maxine Waters meet with families in South L.A. to celebrate the expansion of the Childhood Tax Credit which gives up to $300 per kid per family, depending on income. This is transformative. This is like Social Security. The speaker says 90% of California kids will benefit, cutting childhood poverty in half. For you personally, as a mom, as a grandmother, as the first female speaker, what does it mean to you to meet with people like this and to see the difference that it's making? Well, I appreciate your question. As a mother of five, a grandmother of nine, my first statement is, aren't these children well behaved? The bill is passed. When this bill passed, Pelosi told her colleagues this. I say to them, this is one of the biggest things you'll ever be a part of. But the expansion of the child tax credit is temporary, set to expire in December. You know what the speaker has said? We got to make this permanent. That will not be an easy lift for the speaker. House Democrats want to pass a three and a half trillion dollar human infrastructure bill to go along with a five hundred fifty billion dollar physical infrastructure bill just passed by the Senate in a bipartisan fashion. Do you have the vote for both bills, though? We don't have a bill yet, but when we bring it to the floor, we will have the vote. And next week, right here on The Issue Is, a conversation with Governor Gavin Newsom as the recall fight intensifies. I'm Alex Michelson. Thanks for watching.